It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Welcome into the Take Command podcast. I'm Craig Hoffman. That is Logan Paulson, 10-year NFL veteran. I cover the team for five years, host a daily radio show on the Team 980 if you want to check that out. And I will also mention that little old radio program that we do, Logan, here off the top. Because we're actually not going to do a super deep dive into all of the free agents that the commanders have agreed to terms with so far. That is because we did it on the radio yesterday and we put it as a bonus episode in the Take Command feed. So if you're an audio listener to the show, that information is already available to you. Uh, most of you probably have already listened to it. Uh, if you are someone who watches our full episodes on 106.7 The Fan's YouTube page, you can click over to my YouTube page, youtube.com slash at Craig Hoffman, and that entire segment is available. So if you want the full breakdowns of what Cody Barton could be, what Andrew Wiley is going to be with the commanders in kind of more depth, we already have that available for you. So go check that out. Our feelings won't be hurt. And the beauty of an on-demand uh on-demand platform, Logan, and an on-demand product is we'll still be here when when they're done with that one. <laughs> right. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The only per- people that are, are listening to this right now live are me, you, and our producer, Nick. So Correct. shout out to Nick. Uh, all right. Here's what we are going to do today on this episode of Take Command. We will dive into some of that and also kind of what are the biggest questions remaining, how that shapes the draft. We'll also take a look at some of the other moves in the NFC East and how the commanders are stacking up in the division let's start though with the coaching move logan and what that tells us about kind of the free agency moves and kind of where the team is headed john matsko is let go and we talked about this some on the radio show as well but matsko is let go uh, on the second day of free agency the timing seems pretty bizarre considering they had had a bunch of meetings at the combine with offensive linemen 19 of their 45 meetings at the the combine were with o-linemen matskow is is the guy leading a lot of those meetings Ultimately, uh, John Keim reports this morning that there's philosophical differences between he and what Eric Bieniemy uh, wants to run. What does that tell you about Matskow? Like when you look at what he was doing and, and some of the tape you've watched on Bieniemy, what does that tell you about what we should expect from the commanders this upcoming season related to anything offensive line play? I think the one offensive staff position that's really hard to survive a coaching change, it's got to be the offensive line coach. And it's just, and it's not necessarily, it's just because like whenever a new OC comes in, like they do so much communicating with the offensive linemen, right? They, they, they're kind of this extension of the coordinator. So right when the enemy was hired, you're kind of like, Ugh, like this doesn't look great for Matt Scott. It doesn't look great for the quarterback coach. It doesn't look great for Matt Scott. Just because those positions are, are positions that, like they are the offense, right? So like when you go to a new place, the person that's kind of doing the protections, doing the run scheme, you know, building that identity is the offensive line coach, right? It's the offensive line coach and the guy that talks to the quarterback the most. Like those guys need to be in lockstep with the coordinator. So, um, you know, in terms of what, like being predictive, it's still a little bit up in the air, I think. But I do think one of the things when you watch Kansas City and then compare it to Washington, there was a level of detail, a sharpness, a crispness to the combinations and to the targeting of runs, which wasn't here. Now, is that Matt Scott's fault? Is that Scott's, Scott's fault? I think it's like it's an impossible thing to know, but I do think that that's something that I was like, that's going to need to change when the enemy comes here because when you look at the runs and how they do stuff, it, it's from Kansas City. There's a level of detail and crispness that is that wasn't here. And so either mascot has got to change or the enemy's going to compromise himself. And if anybody's not going to com- compromise himself, it's going to be Eric the <laughs> right? So right. Um, that was something. We've learned we- one thing about EB. Yeah. It's that. And so I think that that's good. And obviously, like, you know, like we're seeing kind of the byproduct of that difference in identity, I think. And again, these are things that I'm speculating at. I don't have any inside information on this. This is just looking at the film, differences in approach, differences in philosophy that I think could have caused some friction. And I think, you know, if you're Eric B enemy, like if I'm, if I'm coming into this coordinator position, I want my O-line coach here, right? I want that dude from Kansas city that, that can communicate what I need to communicate because there's so much detail to that Kansas City offense with regards to the screen game, with regards to the run game, with regards to the RPO game, and that is the offensive line coach. So if that guy's not communicating with you, then or communicating the same message, then it doesn't even it doesn't 
you're, you're putting yourself behind the eight ball. So I think it's, it's a myriad of things. I think there's a little bit of, you know, philosophical difference in approach. I think it's just getting your offense in it's, it's helpful to have that guy. Um, but ultimately, like, I, I think this is the best move for the staff, quite frankly. So it's interesting though, that what perhaps the favorite for the job is then Travell Wharton, who's the assistant yeah. offensive line coach, who's been with Carolina with Ron under Matsko, obviously was a legendary Carolina Panthers player uh, before Rivera got there, uh, started in like 2004, I think is when his career kicked off. Uh, I don't know how much he intersected with Ron. I think, I think he kind of left and then and maybe he came back. I think one year as a player with Ron, his second stint in Carolina before ultimately retiring and becoming a coach where he's again under Ron and under Matzkow. So all that said, like there's a lot of Rivera, Matzkow, Rivera, Matzkow. How does he fit in and why is, is the younger, less experienced coach, the better fit? Is he just more shapeable uh, in that way with the enemy coming in? I mean, I don't know if they made a definitive answer. They haven't. Um, uh, just Kime, well, Kime said that he's he's certainly an option uh, sure. to stick around. And I, and I think I think he deserves to be an option. I think you know, again, like he's more shapeable. He's more familiar with the new kind of the way the NFL game is going. I think that's always a part of it. Like there was something very traditional about the way Matskow coached and game plan for the offensive line. So I think having someone that's a little bit fresher is important. Someone that can learn a new offense from EB is important, but I, I really would not be surprised if like I've heard rumors that the assistant offensive line coach in Kansas city might be the guy next in line. And if, if I'm EB, I'm pulling very hard for that guy to come here. Just again, just because it helps you kind of convey a message helps you kind of convey an identity. And I think Travell Warden could still be the assistant offensive line coach. I think that's right. fine, but I, it's I often think, it's good to have some continuity. Yeah. That way you have a translation almost. Correct. And I think that, that that would be very helpful. But I do think you just you need somebody who can communicate this. And everyone's like, well, how hard is it to communicate? I can hear the comments already. It can be very challenging because it's it's not the scheme. When you look at across the NFL, the scheme is relatively the same. Like everyone runs outside zone. Everyone got and everyone's like, well, West Coast versus, you know, Air Coriel. There's differences. There are differences. But if you look at Kyle's offense, for example, who's like about as West Coast as you can get. He runs Air Coriel concepts and vice versa. So it's like they've kind of blended into an amalgamation of the same thing. The thing that separates the offenses is the details in the coaching. So I want to make sure my O line knows exactly what I want them to know and how I want them to run it. And I need a voice in that room to get that done. So I think um, I think I'm looking for someone from Kansas City staff to come in and get that communicated. And I think because I think that puts EB in the best position to be successful. And if it's Travel right. Warden, I think Travel Warden is a very bright guy. I think he doesn't. He'll do an excellent job if he is the O line coach. But I think he's going to have to work extra hard to kind of understand and get into EB's mind. And I just also want to say this real quick: just because Matt Scott was let's get let go for creative differences or whatever it is the, the wording was, I don't think he's a bad O line coach, right? I don't think he's a bad guy. I don't think he's a bad person. I think this just wasn't the right fit for him. And I think it's mm -hmm. important to acknowledge that also. Definitely. Um, mm -hmm. it, also, we talked about the timing yesterday on the radio. To me, like. I know you say that it's kind of been in the works and it's, it's not, I mean, a that's, that's deal. like a, it's like a rumor, you know what I mean? Like you hear right. rumors and like who, I mean, I like we've, all, this... we've all heard it right. Since, yeah. since, you know, for the, all the reasons that you've said, yeah. I just think it, it's the kind of thing where they, they land on the right result, which is better than landing on the wrong result. Sure. But why can't they get the timing right? And, and that's, that's been something that's happened I think time and time again under Rivera where, you know, landing Collins, the Buffalo nickel is like the most, obvious famous if you will infamous whatever word you want to use example of that where it's like this was so obviously the solution what are you doing waiting this out and with Matsko, it just seemed like it wasn't the right fit okay that's fine um, I understand that he's been with Ron a long time there's a relationship there maybe they wanted to try and make it work but at the end of the day they went through the entire combine process without with, with the wrong guy running the meetings or a guy who's not going to be here running a lot of that stuff. And, you know, they get their, they're set their free agency board. And I know EB has got a huge, huge influence. And so maybe it doesn't matter that much, but it's certainly not optimal. And, and I think in a year where you're trying to win, you want as much to be optimal. I mean, no matter when, right. what you always want things to be as optimal as possible. And this just seems like a self-inflicted wound of non-optimization. Craig, we've been hanging out a lot because I think you you cut me off at the pass. I was saying this isn't like a terrible thing, but you're right. You want this to be optimal, right? This is not an ideal thing. Like if I had my choice, 
you'd want the guy who's going to be your o line coach in those meetings. Now, to calm fans down, they they record these interviews, they have the film, it's all there for them. But you do want them to have some type of personal relationship. Now, let's just say, you know, hypothetically, this nameless Kansas City offensive line coach, he has also gone through these interview processes, right? Does he get the same level of detail? Do they have the same thirty for thirty? I have no idea, but it's it's not it's not a perfect situation, right? And I think it's also important to acknowledge that at this point of the year, coaches, while involved in the evaluation process, are not are not the deciding factors just yet. This is more of a scout centric thing. So while again, it's not an optimal situation, it's not a fatal situation. So. Yes, I would like the guy who's going to coach the O-line to be in these meetings, 1,000%. But I do think it's important to acknowledge that the people who set the meetings are not the O-line coach. He's interviewing them on the behalf of kind of the recommendation of the staff. Like when you go to the combine and you talk, not only this staff, but other staffs around the league, a lot of my O-line coach buddies are like, oh, yeah, I haven't really watched anybody yet. Like I'm still working through some guys. Like I have kind of skimmed this guy or, or whatever. You know, you're still – it's still early in the process for the coaches. So I think that that – that should make you feel somewhat better. But again, I want my coach to meet the guy that we're thinking about drafting and know that he can develop a relationship with him. Cause this is a very interesting story. I think, cause I was in um, one of my buddies who's uh, he was, he's the uh, OCEO line coach in Miami. And he was saying like, I like the interview process cause it lets me know, can I communicate with this guy? Is he my type of guy? And there's certain guys that aren't your type of guy. And it's important to know that going into the draft process. So you know, ultimately, like, is that going to sway a team uh, from picking a guy? Maybe, but I think it is helpful for the coach, you know. So I do think it is significant, less than optimal, not fatal, but, um, yeah, not, not an ideal situation. Yeah, uh, it could be a tiebreaker. You know, if you got two guys on the board and you feel like you can yeah. coach one up better than the other, like, that's a pretty easy tiebreaker. So sure. those things are important. Uh, by the way, Corey Mathai, uh, I'm sorry, Corey, if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Uh, he is the assistant of offensive line coach in Kansas City. The uh, the guy who is the offensive line coach in Kansas City, he's got one of the best O-line biographies ever. His name is Andy Heck, and he's from Fargo, North Dakota. Oh, sick. Oh, who doesn't want Andy Heck from Fargo as their <laughs> offensive line coach? Uh, yeah, on. it's funny. It's funny. Like some old line coaches get like some buzz like around their name, like Callahan, Forrester, those types of guys. But, you know, you don't hear about this guy in Kansas City, but he's obviously done an excellent job. So good for him. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all right. Who? All right. I'm, I'm going to really sports radio this up for you as we, we look back a little bit before we kind of look at what, what we have moving ahead. Which signing that they've made so far? is the most impactful in 2023. So you got Wiley, Gates, uh, yeah. Barton, really. I, I'm not going to necessarily count Payne here, as, even though he's obviously yeah, uh, a the pretty big impactful. freaking deal. Yeah. Uh, but of, of the new guys coming in, who's the most impactful in 2023? Well, you know, that's kind of an unknowable thing, but I think just based on the money. Don't take Wiley. the fun out of it, Logan. It's, it's Wiley, I would say, just because – um, he's got paid the most money, so he's going to play. He's going to play right tackle probably, and if that doesn't work, he'll definitely play guard. So I think like that's – he will play the most for sure. I think Gates is kind of a swing guy. I do think – what's the guy, the linebacker's name? Bolton, is that his name? Uh, Cody Barton. Barton, excuse me. Barton. It took me a full 24 hours to finally get his name down, but yeah. uh, I, I've committed it to memory. Cody Barton. Cody Barton. I think Cody Barton does have probably – He's, he's the most intriguing to me because I think he's got traits that get you excited. Now he hasn't really put it all together, but I think um, Wiley is going to be the guy he's going to start at in some capacity. And let's say they end up drafting a tackle, like, you know, let's say it's in the first round, whatever it is, that's, they're going to find a way to get him on the field because of that pay number. So he's, he'll be the most impactful uh, off season acquisition. No, I agree with that. I think Barton's got a real chance to be very impactful, though. So just before we started recording yeah. this, uh, just for the record, because I, I hate doing this because podcasts are meant to be uh, a little more evergreen, uh, or at least last year, a couple of days. And and the nature of free agency is we're going to hit publish and something dumb's going to happen and, and <laughs> half the things we say are not going to be relevant anymore. So it's, it's currently 948 a.m. on Wednesday, March 15th, for those that are keeping track. And about a, an hour ago, I guess, uh, Cole Holcomb signed with the Steelers. And Barton can come in and either play the mic, play the will, 
one of those two and Jamin will obviously play the other and he's got a chance to be pretty impactful for them. And he's going to have to win the job, uh, you know, and they'll probably draft a linebacker at some point in the draft. They've got a couple guys they brought back. So there, there's kind of a nice floor underneath kind of the David Mayo floor still exists. Um, you know, I think they brought back Milo Eifler as well. Some guys yeah. that like flash in that final game, Khalid Hudson, um, is back and and can he bulk up and maybe be an impact at will if Jamin's playing Mike? So there's there's going to be competition. I would say none of it's spectacular at that linebacker spot, um, but guys like Levante David are still out there. So who knows? Point right. being, Barton's got a chance. He was stuck behind Bobby Wagner in Seattle. He's shown some really nice flashes. And the question becomes if he and he was a top 100 pick. He was the 88th yeah. pick uh, in 2019. So. If he can get some reps underneath him, could he be really impactful? I still think the answer is pretty obvious, and it's Wiley in terms of the three guys. But right. Barton is a guy that people should, like like I have committed to, and like Logan has now committed to, commit the name to memory. He's going to he's gonna play. Uh, he's going to be a name that, that you want to remember and know as you move into the spring. And I also just want to point out, just from a team-building standpoint, I think that's a good process, getting a guy at a good number, kind of a prove-it deal, could play in a bigger role if you need him to. And like you said, the upside is very, very high. I also think it's important to acknowledge that this draft class, not great for linebackers. Like I said, I think I, on the on the bonus episode, I think there's five, six guys that have some high upside. But in terms of consistent, like, blue-chip kind of linebacker guys, I think there's probably two. And I don't think Washington's going to take them where those guys are going to go. So they're going to have to do a little bit bargain bin shopping. It's kind of our linebacker group kind of feels like the land of misfit toys a little bit. But unlike in previous years where you've been with a Bostic, where you've been with a Mayo, guys who are kind of role playing football players who are who are kind of capped in terms of ceiling. Like I love Mayo, but he's you know never going to be he can never grow into something more because that's kind of who he is. I think this this gentleman uh, from Seattle can do more. And I think that is somewhat exciting. Now, his floor is probably lower than Mayo's. But like you said, Mayo's on the roster. So if it goes bad, you have Mayo. And like I think that's a fine stopgap piece. But the ceiling for this guy is significantly higher, I feel, just watching his film from last year. Yeah, definitely. Take a man podcast from Odyssey Sports. I'm Craig Hoffman. He is Logan Paulson. Make sure you are subscribed to us wherever you are watching or listening right now so you do not miss an episode. That is especially important this time of year because we do have bonus episodes dropping uh, when news breaks. So let's say, you know, Thursday afternoon, uh, especially Thursday afternoon, because I don't have a radio show on Thursday and Friday because we got the NCAA tournament. Uh, we'll, if, if they sign a backup quarterback, we can pop in, record 15 minutes on it, and, and if you're not subscribed, you'll you'll never know. So make sure you subscribe wherever you are watching or listening right now. Okay, uh, you mentioned the draft a couple of times. Let's let's go there now. Uh, okay. What is the biggest question remaining for them? And do you think it's something they address in free agency, or is it something they address in the draft? Well, so first off, I just want to applaud the team because I think they're approaching this in in a very forward thinking way. And what I mean by that is that they are. Um, if you can't see the video, Craig's just clapping. He's applauding. I, I quietly applauded as to not interrupt the audio. And then Logan, <laughs> it was too much for Logan to handle. So he laughed and interrupted the audio. I interrupted the audio. Um, so, <clears throat> but they basically what they've done is they said, we are going to address all of our needs in free agency, right? So they've gotten a corner, they've gotten a linebacker, they've gotten their defensive tackle kind of situation worked out. They've got their offensive line pieces in place. And so I think what that allows you to do is it basically says we don't have any incredibly glaring needs. Like there are things that we would like to upgrade potentially in the draft, but we don't need to draft anybody. And so what that does is it lets you kind of go into this mode of picking the best player available. So at 16, I know offensive line corner has been talked about a lot, but all of a sudden now you can say like maybe the best edge rushers on the board for us here, which in terms of gamesmanship is an advantage because now all of a sudden teams go, well, they might actually pick an edge rusher even though they're stacked at edge rusher, right? And we already talked about the pain extension. I think it does kind of make that a little bit more likely because you need to kind of have a contingency for Montez and right. Chase. Right? If you can get Miles Murphy or whichever edge guy falls that you think is a tier one player and right. then you don't have to worry about if you lose Sweat or Young, like you still want to trade one of those guys for assets next year. But like, let's say they walk and you just take the compensatory pick. If you got the replacement, that hurts a lot less. Right. And I think, so that, so that becomes way more viable. And now teams around the league they know what Washington's done in free agency. So they say, well, shoot, if we want that edge player, we have to trade up. So I think it gives you a little bit more oomph 
in terms of trade, like real trade up value. Because before every team knew they need to draft a corner, they need to draft a lineman. So they're not going to draft this defensive end. They're going to reach on an offensive lineman. Now it's becoming much more pliable. So I do think that that is just good process. So in terms of need, obviously I think drafting at one of the like one of those three linebackers, four linebackers with high upside, I think would be great. I still think an offensive lineman. Obviously, Chase Roulier is still in the wind with regard to his decision about this year in terms of extension, in terms of or restructuring, excuse me. So I think that'll be really interesting. Tyler Larson is not re-signed yet, so keep an eye on center. Like, that is the one that's kind of, uh, you know, like flashing right now because they haven't right. – They there are solutions, but none of those guys are on the roster as of right now. Um, I still think you need to find a guy you can play, like who is a tackle, who is a true tackle. Because as much as Wiley is – he played well at tackle last year. He's a very scheme fit. And so I think, you know, he's, he, I think he would be an excellent guard, much like Cosme. So you're doing a good job as an organization of identifying people with positional flex. But I think you need to make sure you have a guy who can play right tackle on the roster. I just think that is, that's something that it needs doesn't to be. seem like a bold take. Yeah. Right. Who, who, who is, who's, who's got high upside at the position. Right. And not that Wiley, Wiley can do it, but he is very kind of scheme dependent. So I'd like a guy that's got a little bit more, that gives you a little bit more flexibility, basically is all I'm saying. Will they do that? I don't know. They don't have to now, but I, I'd like that done. Center, I think center right now, biggest one. Offensive line, and I, and I, because this is such a deep cornerback class, I know you brought in the guy from Minnesota on waivers, right? Oh, yeah, Cam Dantzler. We haven't even talked Cam, about him. Cam Dantzler. I haven't watched him yet, but, you know, okay. kind I'll of – try to get a Cam Dantzler report next week. Yeah, that would be awesome. And then, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely watch him by then. But what I'm saying is, like, you've addressed that, but I do think you want to kind of play for that high upside corner. So I do think the, the things that we talked about two weeks ago are still on the table. It's just not necessary anymore in the same way that it was, and I think that just helps your draft process and makes it a little bit less stressful, which – which is good. That that's it. that's how you want to go into the draft. One hundred percent agree. Um, the other obvious one is they need a backup quarterback. And again, by the yeah, time I mean, this episode sorry, comes out, yeah. um, no, I just it, by the time this episode comes out, that might be taken care of. Um, I think it's interesting that the top guys that we anticipated are off the board. Uh, right. you know, and free agent wise, you're saying, yeah, free agent yeah. wise. You know, uh, Andy Dalton off the board, Taylor Heineke off the board. Um, and those are the two guys. If I had Brissette, to, is met, he still there? uh, Brissette's still on the board. Um, there's a couple other guys. And the one that's actually super, super interesting, I can't decide whether this would be a genius move or this would be like you're outsmarting yourself is Matt Ryan is going to get cut by Indianapolis. Mm, that would like be if you want if you want a mentor and a guy who's been there and done that and is detail oriented and like is a pro's pro, you cannot do better than Matt Ryan. If you want someone who's going to be able to play football for you, you can do better than Matt Ryan at this point in Matt Ryan's career. Well, Last it, year, uh, he was snake bitten uh, in Indianapolis. So who, is that who exactly who he is? Maybe not, but it's not like it was pretty the last year in Atlanta either. There's a reason they were trying to move on from him. So I, I think he's a super interesting name that perhaps was, I, I don't think it's like a, a surprise at all that Indianapolis is going to let him go, but certainly a name that wasn't being bantied about because he wasn't, immediately available and and reports yesterday are that ryan is going to get cut and you'd have to think that like that's that's a name they should they should poke around and, and see what's i don't know what what do you think of it? you played with him you know, obviously know him uh and what he yeah. what he can bring to a quarterback room so what do you think i mean i, I love that i love his I, I love his leadership i love his approach he's a like you said true true pro little bit, um, you know, kind of on the tail end of his career, obviously. Uh, <clears throat> but I do think he can win you some games in a pinch, right? And I think that's what a backup quarterback should be able to do. The thing that I would question is, <coughs> excuse me, is how much money is he going to want? That's the problem that I'm in right now with some of these guys. Because I think Jacoby Brissett would be excellent. But I think he's looking yeah. for that 10, 11-ish, you know, and they said they wouldn't give Taylor more than five, you know. I think Matt is looking for probably like 12 to 15, just knowing his career and knowing what he's been paid. And I think he could probably get it. Like, look at good backups, right? They make good money because of this high upside play. And so I don't know if you, I don't know if Matt comes here for, for 5 million bucks. I don't know. You know what I mean? His career right. trajectory, what he's been paid recently. Like, I just don't know how many teams, like how many teams are still looking though in that range. But I think my, my, my point is that like, it's more for him. 
Like he just mm. came off a you get he was like what is he hundred million dollar quarterback for a while he was making oh, yeah. thirty six million dollars a year like he was like he doesn't need the money the situation has to be right you know the the pay has to be right the situation for his family has to be right like all those things become a factor and so like that that's the only reason I'm like is he the right fit because it doesn't seem like the right fit you know what I'm saying like it just is like for him for financially like why would he come here. Like, and why would EB want him here? Because he hasn't been, like, I think it's interesting that they've called Chad Henney because Chad Henney mm -hmm. was in the system. He was backing up, right? He's been a backer for a long time. I think that would be excellent because he knows the offense. He's an extra kind of coach and communicator for Sam Howell. But Matt's got to learn a new offense. And you probably got to pay him more because of the name, because of all this stuff. And then I wonder how the city here handles a Matt Ryan as the backup. Are they going to be calling for Matt Ryan earlier because of, who he is. I you know don't what I'm think saying? so like, because people are, people are so psyched about how, and I think most NFL fans are like, man, that dude's done. Yeah. You know, maybe. like I, I think, I think mo more people would be mad about Matt Ryan because they're like, he stinks. He's old. He's washed oh, up. Cool. Then realizing that he's here to be in mostly the assistant quarterbacks coach. And right. that would be a hell of a guy to be that for Sam Howell. Yeah, I, I agree. I think if you want a guy who can mentor and do that, like Matt's the guy. And so I would be really excited about, about that if he came here. But again, it's I don't know if that's the right fit for Matt. I don't know if that's the right fit for the team. But in terms of leadership, mentor, coaching qualities, like you're not going to find anybody better than that. Um, who else is available? I know we got a list floating around somewhere. Do we yeah, have no, list? so I just pulled up the list. Uh, for once, I'm one step ahead as opposed to doing the Googling <laughs> on the podcast. Uh Carson Wentz is hilariously the first name on this list. Uh, Mariota, Baker Mayfield, mm -hmm. Teddy Bridgewater, Mason Rudolph, Jacoby Brissett, Joe Flacco, who I think is super interesting. Uh, Kyle Allen, obviously some ties here. Uh, Blaine Gabbert, Chase Daniel, Drew Locke, Brandon Allen, Josh Johnson, Nate Sudfeld, Nathan Peterson, Peterman, sorry. Cooper Rush is a name that's been mentioned. Uh, obviously played uh, in Dallas and played well for them last year. Uh, John Wolfer played for LA some last year. Those are uh, Gardner Minshew. Those are the those are the main names. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, obviously Bridgewater, Flacco, Chase Daniel are the ones that kind of pop out of that because they're older. They've been around. They can kind of fill that mentoring role in a way that Cooper Rush, while a good football player, I'm not sure is equipped to do the same thing. You know, so I I, I would like Cooper Rush, but I think I would probably lean one of those older guys. The problem is that the older guys they know what they bring is valuable. So they ask for a little bit more money, you know, they ask for mm -hmm. more, more resources. So it really comes down to what you're looking for. And I, I, I really think you need somebody who can show him, show Sam Howell how to be a pro and, and have people are like, what do you mean by that? And it's like, how do you study? How do you prep? How do you watch film? Like, how do you approach practice? Like I remember being around Matt, uh, Matt Ryan and Matt Schaub in Atlanta, and they were like a well-oiled machine. You know, and like they just it was like, this is what we're doing at 630 on a Tuesday. You know, this is how we're prepping. This is what we're watching. You know, Matt Schaub is coming with a report for Matt Ryan. And it was just like it was like this crazy, you know, like that's what it means to be a pro, an NFL quarterback. Yeah. And when I was in Houston with um, gosh, Watson. It was the same thing with McCown back up there. Like they were on in lockstep. So finding a guy that understands his role as a backup in relation to the starter and can help mentor him, I think is extremely important. Um, and it, 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 I, and I don't think it's necessary, but I think it's an opportunity to elevate Sam Howell in a way that maybe one of these other younger guys can't do. Agreed. I think Colt was a really interesting example yeah. of a backup here because Colt wanted to play. And I think that's right. the thing that gets twisted here is like, you don't need a guy who's just, you know, retired basically and, and is, is an actual coach. So it's okay. If he wants to play, it's okay. If he still prepares himself. In fact, you want him to be ready to play. You want him to prepare himself. You want that competitive fire, but they just have to be able to do both. Colt yeah. very much thought that he could compete with Kirk cousins and, and, you know, all the other guys that were here and wanted that shot badly to get a chance to play. That didn't affect how he acted towards that player. 
Right. And it didn't affect how he did his job as backup quarterback, which is you just re- very well described is a very unique job in its own right. Like you part of your job as the backup is to help prepare the starter in doing that. You're preparing yourself, Correct. but it's really geared towards the starter. And a guy like Colt McCoy did that very well and kind of straddled that line of both. My question would be, could, for instance, Baker Mayfield do that? Right. Yeah. And like Darnold signs in San Francisco, which is just a freaking steal. Uh, because if Purdy's out and Lance is not right yet, like Kyle will make Sam Darnold look as good as Sam Darnold <laughs> ever looked. And everyone's going to be like, oh my God, how did everyone miss on Sam Darnold? And it's like, will you guys stop doing the thing where you pretend it's always the player and just realize yeah. that the constant thread here is Kyle Shanahan? Anyway, <laughs> sidebar, um, you know, but a guy like Darnold, a guy like, you know, he's obviously off the table. Um, Baker Mayfield is probably the most talented guy available. Right. And he played all right for LA last year. Uh, he obviously was not very good for Carolina. Um, but could he come in and embrace that role? But also I think the risk is, and this is an interesting, you know, kind of philosophical choice as well. I don't know if they want Baker Mayfield because in a competition setting, a guy who's a former number one overall pick, crazy arm, quick release. Lots of NFL experience. Pretty good chance he beats out Sam Howell on the merits. Uh, and I don't necessarily think they want someone who's going to beat out Sam Howell, or at least not beat him, you know, soundly enough that they can't look at that, you know, thirty-eight-year-old Matt Ryan or Joe Flacco and be like, "Hey, he's worth the upside." <clears throat> yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons you like the older guy is because it's clear. You're like, you are here to support right. him, and when you bring in someone like that, even though you might tell him, you might say, "Hey." Baker, you are, we're, we're going to try and get the young guy going. We want you to compete, but it's probably going to go to Sam. That doesn't always go that way. You know what I mean? It's not as clear. It's not as clear cut. They don't. He well, and also, sure like, Baker if they genuinely team. compete, Baker's probably going to win. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like Sam's pretty talented in his own right, but I, I agree. I sure. think he's very talented. And well, also, like, I in, think the- in, if you take the projection out of it, right? And and yeah. just like where are they right now sure. in a in an OTA or training camp setting? Never the, an actual game, different story. Like Sam's a gamer, you know, all his, everything. Yeah. But like, if you're if you're gonna say who's gonna be better at practice tomorrow, Sam yeah. Howell current version or Baker Mayfield current version? I know this is like upsetting to people who love Sam Howell and think Baker Mayfield's the worst quarterback ever. But like <clears throat> tomorrow in practice, Baker Mayfield would be the better quarterback. Yeah, I, I agree. And I also think the personality of Baker Mayfield, like the big personality, is always really tough in this kind of situation. So as much as he is talented, as much as he's been a backup, like I don't know if you want that that noise in here, right? Because people are gonna ask about him. The meet like we are gonna ask about Baker Mayfield in relation to Sam Howell and what you're seeing. Oh, he made some throws and Baker is not good, at least in my experience watching him at like towing the party line and saying the right things. He's going to be very kind of of his opinion, and it's going to be very clear what he thinks, which isn't always the best thing for team building, right? And I think that's something like, I call it the Tim Tebow effect. Yeah, could Tim Tebow have played backup quarterback for the New York Jets, be the third string guy? Yeah, but you don't want your third string quarterback having press conferences every day, talking about how cool it is to be the third string quarterback. Like, you don't want that. And I think in this situation, that would be detrimental to Sam. And if you want Sam to grow, You want Mm -hmm. someone who can win you games, but isn't going to be this big overbearing personality. And I think that's what a guy like Baker, you know, would, would probably bring. Right. And that's not all Baker's fault either. Right. It's like the media intrigue and just, yeah, he was, he was one, one overall. Like, of course people are going to ask about him. He can't help it that, that, that was uh, where he was chosen and and how his career has played out. Um, I mean, obviously he's had an impact on his own career. You get what I'm saying? Uh, So, yeah, I, I think that that happens sooner rather than later. Something uh, we'll find out. I still think Brissett's the number one guy. Um, he would be my choice. I think he's the best combination of yeah. vet, you know, but can play. Uh, but we'll see. Um, I think Flacco's super interesting. He played pretty well for the Jets in, in some stretches last year. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think there's some good options still available. But What do you think Brissett gets? Cause, and do you think Brissett wants to be a backup? Because if you look at his numbers last year and no, I, that is part of the problem. Yeah. Um, I think he wants to go somewhere where he's going to have a chance. I just don't know, like, who still needs a quarterback? Yeah, like that's that's, that's part of the uh, the issue. Is like most teams are have their guy. I don't know how many teams are out there that you know. It, it maybe is is he interested in a place like well, Houston just signed Case Keenum or like Arizona, but, 
Arizona, Arizona right. But they, I mean, he knows that Kyler is going to come back. Um, but he could definitely get some play time because he signed a one year deal and be like, maybe, it, you know, because he's 30. Yeah. It's not like he's a young guy, but at 31 next year, could I get a, you know, a low end starter job? Like a Geno I, Smith. Yeah. Kind of deal. Right. Exactly. I, don't, I just don't know how many opportunities are available. I still think he's probably expensive, but the market is shifting. Like the nature of these jobs getting filled is that both there are fewer of them available, but also fewer teams that need. So it's like a very right. interesting market. <clears throat> and does a team, it, the really question is, does a team get desperate and give Brissett what he wants? Probably 10, 11 million. Uh, or is he just like, you want to know what? Working with Eric Bieniemy sounds cool. Um, this yeah. Howell kid seems sweet. I want to be in a good quarterback room. I think I might have a chance to play at some point this year. And if I do, I like the weapons they have and I can be successful. I'm going to go to Washington for, for five. Yeah. I doubt it. Um, yeah. And, but like in terms if on my board, if I'm like picking the options per sets one, realistically, I don't know if they can afford it. I agree. I mean, I totally agree. It just, it just depends on what he wants. And I think the other thing is I, I think they'll get something done, but if they don't, like, do you draft a quarterback? Not high, but are you drafting like a Tanner yeah. McKee? Or, you know what I mean? Like, is that? I kind of think they solution? might anyway. Yeah, yeah I, but I, I kind of think they need, might have a third. Yeah, you need some type of solution here, and I, it, you need to sign somebody. Is basically what it boils down to. Because I don't think you want Tanner McKee being your backup quarterback to Sam Howell. So that's a, something right. has to get done. It just it'll be interesting to see what they finally decide on. All right, let's just go. Yes, no. Would you want them? Uh, if they're willing to sign here for a price that you like on the following Marcus Mariota. No. Same Baker, Same. Uh, Baker Mayfield. Emphatically, no. I mean, uh, no, for the reasons we just said for Baker. Okay. Teddy Bridgewater. Yes. Same Mason Rudolph. He's interesting. He's been a backup. He's been around for a little bit, I guess. Yes. But he would be like my second tier. Yes. You know what I mean? Like he would yeah, not be I'm like not that my first in- but but yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, let's let's yeah. say let's say those top guys are off. Let's say, sure. you know, like guys that we really like are off. Then it's like, well, yeah. You know what I mean? Like he's not like a bad guy. Could he win you some games? Probably. Like, can he be a backup? Yes. Is he exciting? No. Is I guess before. Yeah. He'd be at the bottom of my tier two. Uh Brissett were both a yes if you the price yes. is right. Flacco? He's, he's probably the number one. I would yeah. say yes for Flacco, just because I think he can, he's done it. Same. Uh Kyle Allen, comeback tour. <laughs> um prob probably not. I don't know. Probably not. Same. Uh Blaine Gabbert. He's interesting because I never liked him as a player, but he seems to have found like a nice niche as a backup doing good stuff. So I'll say yes. I agree with that. Um, he's been with Brady the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, and I would like him to take his back up to Tom Brady and be like, this is what Tom used to do. Not right. that it's a hundred percent of like, this is what Tom used to do. Cause Brady's a, you know, like a freak of nature mentally. Um, and trying to put that same load on Sam Howell just doesn't seem wise. That's no disrespect to Sam Howell. It's just like the mental stuff is why Brady's the greatest of all time. Uh, right. but taking some of that seems valuable. Uh, Chase Daniel, like the yeah. ultimate career backup. Yeah, like absolutely. Yeah. I mean, because he's like, he's just done. He's going to want a lot of money, I bet. But like, he's just done it and he's good at it. He's been around great quarterbacks. He's been around young quarterbacks, old quarterbacks. Like talk about a guy who's the coach, coach in that room. Like he's his, his resume speaks for itself in, in this role. Yes. Uh, Drew Locke. I'm going to go no on that for the same reasons as Mayfield. Yeah, so I think it's a little bit different than Mayfield because he's not quite the same celebrity. So, like, let's say you're in that kind of tier two guy, every all the big name, all the kind of good career backups are gone. I'd kick the tires on that. Okay. Uh, Brandon Allen, been the backup for Burrow. Oh. Last couple of years. Cincinnati. I don't know that much about him, actually. So, maybe do you know uh, anything about him? He's 30. Uh, I believe he went to Arkansas. Yeah, he went to Arkansas. Oh, right. Um, he was in jacksonville for a while uh, he doesn't blow doesn't blow my doors off because i don't know anything about him to be totally candid but he yeah. might be an excellent backup quarterback yeah. so I, I need I'm, to do some I, i'm moderately intrigued at the bottom of like tier one top of tier two just because right. he's been with burrow and it's like okay what can what can we learn from that Correct. uh josh johnson just <laughs> <coming back around. laughs> uh, um probably not I, th- I think like yeah he's a good like kind of 
pull like break class in case of emergency, like off the street, come to the team kind of thing. But yeah. I don't think I'd want him around. I've much. lived that that Josh Johnson experience <laughs> as a reporter in 2019. All right, I'm going to try to narrow this down to three more. Uh, Nate Sudfeld, talk about a I, return retour. Old yeah, Nate. I mean, I I don't hate that. You know, he's been around some good offenses. He was in uh, San Francisco for a while. Like he studied well as a, as a rookie when he was here. So that that seems like a nice fit. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that kind of Philly KC system. He's he spent some time yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Um, that's that to me is actually legitimately not a bad a bad one. Uh, Cooper Rush, Dallas quarterback, played. He's on the higher end of like guys who have had some success on this list right. uh, based off what he did last year. If we're being honest about it, yeah, I think if you're looking for a guy to come in and compete and push, I think that's a nice thing. I think he's a little bit limited from an arm standpoint, from like what the offense can do with him at the helm type thing, but. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I mean, he's probably a tier two ish guy, one, you know, bottom of one, top of tier two guy for me. But I think, yeah, if if, if he's available and they sign him, I'm like, cool, Cooper Rush. Yeah. Nice. And then the last two I'll mention uh, Gardner Minshew. I am a big fan of Gardner Minshew. I like what he does. I think he's got a little moxie. I think, you know, I don't know how he prepares, but in terms of how he plays, I think he elevates offense. It's kind of, he's like Taylor Heineke, yes. maybe a little plus. Like he's in that same group. So but I he's got like that, that same moxie too. Yeah, which I love. I like that on a backup. And it just depends on how he is in the room being a backup, yeah. I think would be the thing with him. And the last one I'll mention, uh, just because he's literally here at the bottom of this list I'm looking at, Shane Bouchelle, uh, 25 years old, was in Kansas City the last couple of years, uh, former Texas quarterback. So he's, he's a guy to keep an eye on. Yeah. Doesn't have the veteran experience or anything, but he's been in the room with EB. That's is a he a guy deal. that they – you know, potentially bring in even as a fourth and try to have around during training camp and stuff like that. People, I remember uh, listening to the broadcast last year uh, during or watching back the preseason game uh, yeah. because we played or Washington played in Kansas city. Mm-hmm. And thus the, uh, the, the replay on game pass was the home team broadcast. So all, sorry, sorry to you, Logan is part of the all-star crew for the Washington preseason broadcast, but listening to Kansas city's uh, announcers talk about Bouchelle, like they seem to really like him a uh, mm. smart guy. Um, and he can play a little bit in terms of running around doing some of the Sam Howley type stuff, a very, very poor man's version, but uh, is an interesting guy. Take a man podcast from Odyssey Sports. Let's wrap up looking around the NFC East. <laughs> a lot of moves. Uh, Philly yeah. uh, re-signs Bradbury. They get uh, Rashad Penny. Uh, they lose, obviously, TJ Edwards. They lose Javon Hargrave. Dallas makes the monster move yesterday for Stephon Gilmore. Their defense looks like it's going to be gross. The Giants trade for Darren Waller. Uh, so they've had an active uh, free agency period here as well. Uh, if, if you're watching the video, you see the commanders plus 1000 to win the division. So uh, <laughs> certainly not favored. Uh, how do you think this division stacks up right now? And what, what are some of your favorite moves that have been made, uh, whether it's commanders or otherwise? Oh, man. I, so two moves that really stick out to me. I love that Philly re-signed Bradbury. I think that was essential yeah. for that defense. Um, and also the Darren Waller thing. Like, I am a huge fan of Darren, Darren Waller. Like, I love watching him on film. I wish he could stay healthier more consistently. But he is explosive. He's twitched up. He's big. He's basically, like, the closest physical comparison because I got to meet him at tight end U. He's like Julio Jones playing tight end. Like, he's that big and twitchy and explosive. So, I love that fit, especially if you're the Giants trying to build around Daniel Jones. Like, that's an awesome piece because it gives, and especially if you're looking for mismatches, like that's what Dayball does. You can line him up at true X receiver. You can line him up at Z. You can F. You can block in line pretty good. Like, he pass pro a couple years ago, like probably the best in the NFL. So, I like that a lot. Um, and then I, the Gilmore thing, kind of on the fence about, but those are my two probably favorite. How about you? You got two you like? Yeah, I mean, the the Bradbury thing is huge for Philly. Um, I don't know whether they'll be able to retain he and Slay. They had kind of signaled oh, this was coming because right. they had said, hey, Slay, you can go pursue a trade. So I don't know what that means. But they means did that last year, them. too. That's kind of their... That's kind of their tactic, right? Is like when a guy's asked, uh, Fletcher Cox did that last year. So he was asking for too much money. They said, seek a trade. And then basically, you know, it, it allows your agent to kind of look around. And basically the mm-hmm. agent comes back and is like, this is the market for you. Do you want to leave to go somewhere else for the same amount of money? And usually the answer is no. So I think that's 
I think they're trying to leverage this to keep Slay, but I think right, you know, that's kind of their their, their style. And, and if if they can keep Slay, like they're going to be still really really good. Uh, obviously, one of the best moves of free agency is is a low money one. Brandon Graham's just like I want to be in Philly. I like it yeah. here. Um, this is where my family is. I'm not moving. I don't care that I could go get paid. So they they keep some of their depth, but losing Hargrave is big. Losing Edwards is big. Um, they're just not going to be as good defensively. But if they can keep Slay, I think they're still very good enough to be the favorites in, in the division. And they also they also have a top 10 pick and they have another first round right. pick. Like they and have, they have a dudes lot of... who didn't even play last year. Right. Absolutely. Nicobe D. So, yeah. Yeah. Like it's it's pretty crazy uh what Philly's been able to do uh, mixing and matching free agency and the draft. Um the Waller move is one I get for both sides. The Raiders get to move off a ton of money. Um and the other thing is Waller hasn't been healthy in a while. Um, yeah, like he two had years. two monster years. And I just, I don't know what's, you know, it, how random that is versus like, nah, his body's just not going to hold up uh, because this is a guy's a former wide receiver. He's bulked up to tight end. You know, do, is he just carrying too much weight for his body as he gets over 30? I mean, he's going to be 31 in September. Mm. So uh, is it a kind of thing where he's just not going to be able to maintain that level? If he can, that move is sick for the, for the giants. Like they're, that is a, a plus weapon for a guy who likes to throw the tight end in Jones. Um, uh, another move piece where like he and Saquon and, and all these different guys can move around. Like, I really, really like the, the upside of that move. I get it for the giants. If it doesn't wind up working out, it doesn't wind up working out. But I mean, the fact that they turned Kadarius Tony into that pick and then turn that pick into Darren Waller is a pretty nice upgrade. Um, even though I know that, uh, Tony obviously is playing well in Kansas city, but it just wasn't the right thing uh, or right fit in New York. The Gilmore move, man, if he's good, yeah, and he's he, opposite of Diggs and that pass rush, Dallas's defense is going to be gross. It just is. It, I guess the question is, is like, where is he at in his career? You know, like where, you know what I'm saying? Like how good is Gilmore going to be would be my question. And I think he's a good player. And I do think that's like the right move, getting some good coverage players and like you said, pairing it with that pass rush. But I, part of me is like, is he on the decline? Because he was the best corner in football like two, three years ago. And, and sometimes those there? guys drop off fast. Like Nami yeah. Asamoah back in the day was yeah. like the best corner anyone had ever seen. And then two years later was not even playable. Right. So sometimes for corners, it does go fast. But I think Indianapolis is willing to move off of him because they're just in a different stage of where like they, sure. they were ready to compete and go for it. And now they're like, ah, oh, crap we got to rebuild yeah so i i tend to think that he probably still has something left in the tank um he's not super old i can look up real quick but he's i mean i'll be surprised if he's any older than 30 if he's even that old i think he's 31 is he is oh he is he's 32 what do you know okay, yeah. okay so maybe he is getting up there there you go uh they also cowboys resign late vander ash um so I, I still think this division is going to be very similar to what it was last year. If folks stay healthy, um, you know, you're always one key injury from one team completely falling off. But I think these are four good teams. And, you know, coming into December next year, when they all start playing each other, like I think the division is going to be on the line. I think multiple playoff spots are going to be on the line. Like I think it's a genuinely good division and a pretty bad conference. Yeah, I think so too. And I think it's everyone's trying to build their roster to, beat Philadelphia you know like look at mm -hmm. you bring in cornerbacks in to deal with those two receivers and I guess my question is what is Washington done and have they done enough to kind of keep pace you know so um I, I think the moves that they've made in free agency are good moves um but are they uh, are they enough to kind of keep you going and free agency is not done and like, they've done a really good job of projecting growth from certain players and in, in the offseason like Jamin last year and mm -hmm. um DeForest Saint Buckner Juice. yeah all you know all those guys like They've done a really nice job of that, so they know where the roster's at, but it seems like you know everyone's kind of bringing out the big guns and they're really making a push to beat Philly. Is Washington kind of in that same boat, or, or what's going on? So that would be something to keep an eye on as the free agency continues and then with the draft and the moves they make there. Right. This is the hard part about prognosticating this time of year is like our eyes are attracted to shiny objects. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, is it – is the big sexy name actually any better than just creating space for a guy to play? Like, right. you know, the, oh, the Eagles lose TJ Edwards. What if they're upgrading by letting Nicobe Dean play? Like, right. those are the kinds of things you just don't know. Like, is is paying pain and giving him, like, hey, man, now you got to go, you got to go prove it. And, like, the continuity of Allen and Payne together and getting Chase back, like, 
is that enough to elevate the commanders to a different level? And Jamin in year three, like turns into a monster. So like right. there, sometimes continuity and growth is actually the best strategy. And you look back and you're like, well, the free agent guy didn't, didn't really work out. And, uh, the, the young guy coming into his own, that was actually the right play. So it's, I, it feels like Washington has not done quite enough. And the corner is the big one. You, know, you mentioned, you know, Dallas obviously now has two corners. Philly's got two corners. Uh, the giants have a couple of guys, you know, Dory Jackson, uh, obviously a big one. Uh, and they're, they're trying to continue to develop, but they probably need to add one more. Cause it's not just, you know, for the other three teams, not Washington, it's not just the two guys in Philly. It's the three guys here right. um, that they have to stop as well. But can they, can Washington get what they need on the outside? Uh, to secure it up and also, you know, Cam Curl, you know, retaining him and, and getting taken care of him. You know, there, there's a lot of continuity at play here for Washington. And defensively, that's not a bad thing. No, no. And I think, like you said, like, you know, free agency in recent years has become very popular because of like Los Angeles Rams and what they did in terms of trading and making big moves and how that elevated their team. But prior to that, free agency was kind of a crapshoot. You know, you bring guys in on big money. They never perform the way you thought they were going to perform. So I, I'm I'm okay with this. It just, you know, it's a little bit quieter. We kind of expect them to be that way. Not a bunch of big flashy moves, but guys that kind of are scheme fits. They know the system. All good things. But, you know, I, I do think corner, offensive line, all those things still, I think, could have some finishing touches. And can they get that done in the draft? I would think so. And then all of a sudden, if those guys, if those draft picks pan out, you're in a pretty good right. spot to, to be pretty dangerous. So, um, One news item that's going right now, uh, Clarence Hill of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram saying uh, the Cowboys are set to part ways with Ezekiel Elliott. So mm. um, that's been something that's kind of looming. They obviously franchise tagged Tony Pollard. Um, the thought Zeke has is, is wanted to stay a Cowboy. Um, there's been kind of the reporting around that, that he was willing to take less money and restructure and, and all that. Uh, but it looks like they may just part ways with Zeke. So it'll be interesting to see what Dallas does there. Kind of a, a run-based scheme. At least they have been the last couple of years. Uh, what do they do now? down in Dallas. So keep an eye on that. Have more reaction, obviously, as things happen on the radio. And then we will also, over the next couple of days, probably pop back on here to do any kind of reaction to any significant move that happens for the commanders. Uh, in the meantime, make sure you're following along on social media as well. Logan's doing breakdowns for Command Center on YouTube and some of those clips on his Instagram at Logan underscore Paulson82. You can follow me for some takes. No, nope, I love love some tweet takes at Craig Hoffman, uh, and then I'll see y'all on the radio Wednesday, and then we'll be back on the radio on Monday. Uh, fresh pods coming as well, so make sure you're subscribed. That's it. That's all. That's the housekeeping. That's the rambling. See you. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't you why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067, the fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do, do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart.